the breadboard diagram for the NAND gate in the assignment. I screwed up. So I fixed that last night. That's the announcement I sent out. This is the corrected version. Okay. So the schematic is correct, and that was correct the whole time. Uh, basically, the mistake that I made was I got pins one and three backwards on the two NANDs, or sorry, uh, NMOSs, and that's corrected up here now. I, I was just smoking something, so sorry. Uh, it's fixed. Um, so what do I need? I need one of their pin ones connected to ground, the other pin one connected to pin three of the grounded one, and then this pin three goes to the output. Is there any reason why I put this pin one as the ground one as opposed to the other one? No, I could have done it either way. I just had to make a choice. Okay, the other error that the guys pointed out this morning is this yellow wire should be... Uh, it should be to this one, not that one. Okay, so I, I went up one, two, one spot too far. Okay, and the reason for that is, well, what's the whole point, right? And, and you guys noticed I tried to color code this, so the... Um, Oh, man, and I screwed up this one, too. God, they'll pay anybody to just teach here, right? This is pathetic. So what should this green wire have been? Up one. And what should this yellow hub wire have been? Down one. Okay, so I was trying to color code the green and the yellow so that green was input A, or sorry, uh, green was pin 4, input B, and yellow was pin 2, input A. And just to, to kind of help you guys visually keep everything straight. And and I clearly failed. So, yeah. Um, I failed. I'm sorry. Uh, it could be worse, though. Right? Because I could be a beta theta pi. No? Too soon? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Um, so, I just wanted to point out that quick error. Um, and I'll correct this correction again, but the schematic was always correct. Um, and, uh, yeah, so sorry about that. Um, okay, good. But did the, the NANS gate construction, that went okay? Yes. Okay, I see a bunch of faces, smiling faces that I'm convinced by, and then some smiles that I'm not so convinced by. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's get back to the math. So, let's talk about Boolean algebra and logic, okay? Um, and at first, this is going to seem like, you know, this seems like it has something to do with what we've been talking about, but it's not obvious. And then suddenly everything is going to become clear, and you'll be like, ah, oh, that so capped, his eyes uncovered. It's a Star Trek reference. Okay, so Boolean algebra um, and logic, um, and we could even throw in here set theory. Okay, so let me just start with a couple of the words that we're going to use. And to demonstrate that, let me do the old Venn diagram thing. And I'm going to make a bunch of copies of this. Okay. So let's say that I have a set A and I have another set B. Then what is uh, the intersection or you might use the word and with these two things. So what do you think that would be in this case? Huh? So like if I were to shade, what should be that in my picture between A and B? It would be that little sliver in between, right? So this stuff is in both sets, okay? And in symbolically, we can write this as A intersect B. Okay, so this is English, sets, and then we'll write logic and bool. Oops. Let me try that again. Okay, 
Now, how many of you guys have seen that upside down use symbol before? You've probably definitely seen the right side up version of it for union back when you were in like algebra and stuff, okay? So this just means the upside down version just means what's in both sets rather than what's in either one. Okay, does that make sense? All right, logically, we would write this as A, and then instead of a roundy thing, we use a pointy one, okay? And in Boolean logic, oops, uh, Boolean algebra, we'll write this as the product of the two, okay? So how do I write multiplication uh, in math class? I couldn't put a dot in between things, but if two things are just next to each other, then they're just automatically being multiplied, right? Just putting them next to each other is called juxtaposition, um, and that is code for multiplication, okay? So, um, right. Okay, so we cool with that? All right, similarly, if I take, um, let me pick a different color, and let's do the union or the English word or, okay, what would I shade in there? Everything in either of the two circles. Okay? And in set theory, I would write this as A union B. In logic, I would write this as A or B. And in Boolean algebra, I'll write it as A plus B for reasons that will become somewhat more obvious later. Okay, so good so far. Now, the union symbol, the, the U, you guys have seen that before in, should have been in like high school algebra or something when you were like talking about uh, intervals that a function had some property, like it was positive or negative or something. And let's say the function was positive over here and then it was negative and then it was positive more over there. Then you'd write this interval union that interval yeah, and it just meant that you were throwing the two things together. Same thing here, okay? Um, and then logic is basically just the same symbol, but pointy instead of roundy, just to keep things interesting. Um, and then uh, the Boolean one being a plus, man, that's not so obvious why that's a good choice now, but it will be later, okay? Just trust me on this for, for right this instant. Okay, so we've got and and or. What kind of other operations could we talk about when uh, in terms of shading things, right? Could I also talk about being not in A or not in B? In which case, what would I shade? So not A would be everything outside of A, okay? Possibly things in B, but also possibly other stuff, okay? Um, so for example, let's say, um, and, and just to, to, to signify this, what I'll do is I'll put a box around it so let's say there's things in A, there's things in B, but there might be things that are in neither of them. That's certainly possible, right? Okay. Um, and so if I wanted to shade um, not A, then I would write this as A complement, not A, or A bar. These are the three different notation schemes for whether or not we're talking sets, we're talking logic, or we're talking Boolean, okay? Um, so sorry that there's a lot of different symbols, but, uh, you know, I told you we were doing math today, so that kind of comes with the territory, yes? All right, so what's not in A in my picture? I mean, it's almost silly to say it that way, but what would I shade? Everything that's not in A, oops, not in A, but did I get some stuff that happened to be in B? Yeah, some of it, um, but not all of it, right? Because there's some of the stuff that's in B that's also in A, okay? Um, okay, and this idea of being in a set or not in a set, or a statement being true or false, right? Those should be intuitive, okay? If we take, for example, this set, everybody sitting in this room, okay, is a set, let's say that's set A, okay, and let's take the set of all students who are in calculus this semester is set B. Raise your hand if you're in the intersection. Raise your hand if you're in the union. 
okay, every hand should have gone up. Why should every hand sh should have gone up there? Because or, are you guys in computer science or math class? Yeah, every last one of you is. Only if some of you happen also to be in a math class this semester. And so for the and or the intersection, only some of the hands are going to go up. Theoretically, it would have been possible for none of the hands to have gone up. Okay, and that would have meant that A and B didn't have any common intersection. Um, I mean, who knows, right? How many of you guys are uh, in this class and female? Well, not a lot of hands just went up, did they? Okay, sort of by definition of the college, but you, you get the point, right? So the intersection could have nothing in it, or there could be something in it. It just depends on, on what categories we're, we're talking about. We? Okay, so, um, right. So Boolean algebra, okay, or this truth stuff, we're going to write down some statements that are kind of, uh, they're all going to be equivalent in some way, okay, but it's just sort of which notation are we using, and you can use that drawing sets with Venn diagrams is easy to make the others easy, or you can just use English sometimes to help. Um, okay, so what questions, any questions over what's on the screen now, because I'm going to need to go to a clean sheet. Good? Okay. So, um, let's take a couple of statements here. Okay, first off, what would happen if I wrote in English? All right, so let me, let me label this. Let's have English here. We'll have um, sets here. We'll have logic here. And we'll have Boolean stuff over there. And I am terrible at spelling today. Okay, so if I said not, not A, what does that mean? That's the same thing as just A, right? Double negatives cancel out. That's also like math class. That's nice. In set theory, this would be the complement of the complement is just the same thing. In logic, not, not A is A, oh, it's not equal, sorry, wrong symbol. Okay, so in logic we use, rather than the equal symbol, we use an arrow with two, uh, a, a double-sided arrow. Okay, and then in the Boolean uh, thing, this would be that the complement of the complement is the original set. So all four of those things are basically encoding the same idea. We're just using sort of four different notation schemes for it. English, uh, set theory, notation, logic notation, or Boolean algebra notation. Okay, good? All right. Um, let's throw some other ones in here. Let's take true or A. What is that? True or A? Does it matter what A is? It's going to be a true statement. Okay, so in set theory, this would be, um, the notation here would be like everything, which we'll call X, um, or A is the same thing as X. Okay, so when I drew that big box around everything, the set of every possible thing, we'll just call X for sort of the universe, okay? In logic, this would be a true or A is true. Okay, and I'll just use T for true. In Boolean algebra, what, what's another way of saying true? What's another symbol I could have used? Okay, that's a word though, a single symbol. How about one? Yeah? Okay, so one or A is A, or sorry, one. 
Okay. Now that one may feel a little bit weird to you because it looks like I'm like in algebra, you would think that that meant a is zero, but it could be the case that a is one um, because what's one plus one in a logical sense. Okay. In math, it's two. Okay. But what's true or true is still true, right? So one plus one in Boolean algebra is still one. Okay, that's why this is a little weird. Okay, but this isn't like regular high school algebra. This is Boolean algebra. It's a different sort of algebra. How many of you guys are horrified that there therefore are multiple algebras, plural? Is that pretty horrifying? Sorry. The rest of you are just like, I don't want to say anything. No? Okay. It, it'll sink in. Okay. All right. So I just did true or A. Could I have done false or A? Right? Same idea. Okay. What does that mean, though? False or A is equivalent to A. Okay. And in set theory the notation, this would be the empty set. Do you guys remember the, the notation for the empty set from high school? Right, so it's a zero. It's kind of with a vertical slash through it. means the set that has nothing in it. Yes? Okay. Um, this or A is A. Right? If I add nothing to a set, what do I get? That set. Right? That's not shocking when you put it in those terms. Okay, in logic, this would be false or A is false. Oops, I keep writing equals. I'm sorry, guys. This should be double arrows. Okay, and then if true is a one, what do you think a good symbol for false would be? How about a zero? Okay, so zero plus A is equal to A. Now, that one looks really obvious from because it matches what you would expect from high school or like elementary school for that matter, right? That one's not rocket science. We oui, no. Okay. So I just did two things with or. I could have instead done the same stuff with and, okay? So let's do true and A. And that is equivalent to just A. Okay, and here's why. What's, what's in everything and an A? Well, just the stuff in A. Okay, so that would be like if I did the Venn diagram style. If I wrote this in logic style, I would have this and In Boolean style, I would write 1 times A equals, well, what do you think? A, right? So the reason that we write this Boolean stuff, okay, kind of like you did high school algebra is because a lot of the rules look the same, okay? And so we can take advantage of the fact that you guys are all comfortable with high school algebra, in this new context, okay? Now, yes, it's not perfectly the same as high school algebra because we get this weird one plus A equals one thing, right? That's sort of unusual, but zero plus A equaling A or one times A equaling A, well, that, that seems pretty, pretty logical, yeah? Okay, all right, what about false and A? What do you think that's equivalent to? Nothing. False. Okay, now here's maybe another way to think of it. What's the stuff in common between a set that has nothing in it and any other set? Nothing. Right? Because the one set has nothing in it. So, 
this is equivalent to the empty set, which in a logical sense is the idea of falseness. Okay. Oh, the circle with the, uh, the empty set. So it's a set that has nothing in it. All right, uh, false and A is false. And here's maybe why it should be obvious. What do you think zero times A is? Yeah, it's zero, okay? So again, the notation sort of matches the high school stuff and that can be useful to us. Okay, so this is how true and false kind of play with things. Now, in terms of the circuits, okay, this at first, does this have anything to do with the circuits at first glance? No, but does it? Yes, okay? Because if I make an AND gate and I have one input that's always on, the output purely depends on the other input, okay? Well, that's exactly what we said here, just in sort of a notation sense, okay? So all of these, um, are equivalent to sort of different situations with circuits, okay? Uh, and, and that's kind of why I'm talking about this, so that we can, if we develop these tools, we can then use them to help us with more complicated circuits than we've done so far. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So that's the, the kind of, um, that's the, the crazy plot that I'm up to here. I'm not just doing this because I like math. I'm gonna do, but there's an ulterior motive. <laughs> okay, um, so there's those, okay, and then there are some other rules, um, so there's some distribution rules, there's some uh, things called the Morgan's Laws, and we'll talk about th those in turn, but let's say that I had the following. Okay, so this would be A intersect B union C, or A and B or C, or A times B plus C. Okay, so I have these four things that all mean the same thing, okay? And what I want to do is show you a second way that we could write all of them. And for reasons that will become clear, let me actually start on the right with the Boolean one. Okay, so scribble all those down, and then let's take a moment to, to, to think. Pray tell. You guys looking forward to Chicken Tender Day at Sparks? Yeah. You have no idea how much joy Chicken Tender Day brought everybody last year. And then how much sadness when there was one Wednesday where they couldn't get the chicken tenders in in time and they had to do like chicken nuggets instead or something. And everybody was walking around like, they can't even give us chicken tenders. <laughs> all despondent. So. Of course, you frat guys don't get chicken tenders. So. You, you don't know what you're missing out on, man. So you do. All right. So let's start with the Boolean one, which is the one on the right. Okay. If I had asked you before you walked into class and you had no idea what we were talking about, to write this in another way, how would you have written it? Yeah. Exactly. You would have been like, oh, I know how to distribute. I could write this as AB plus AC. Right? Just distribute the A to both terms. Yeah? Okay. Well, guess what? You can do that in Boolean algebra also. Okay? So those two things are the same. So let's put equal in between them. And then, now that I kind of know what the answer is going to be, I can encode that in the other uh, notation scheme. So I can have A and B, or B and C, or sorry, A and C is what I meant. 
Okay, so let me put bars in between here just to keep things uh, clean. Okay, so this would be A, uh, intersect B, or A, intersect C, and this would be A um, and B, or A and C. All right, so this one's maybe a little bit more complicated to think of in terms of like um, categories because I really need three categories. So I would need something like, let's take set A to be the people that are in this room, set B to be the people who are in a math class this semester, and set C to be the set of independents. Okay, just for giggles. All right, so who is in the set of people that are either in a math class or an independence? Raise your hand. Okay, so remember this set. So you guys are math class or independent. All right, now of you guys, how many of you are also in computer science? Well, the exact same group because you're all sitting in this room, okay? Uh, on the other hand, I could have thought about it like this. I could have thought about it, how many of you are in this class and calculus? Okay, so that's some of you. How many of you are in this class and an independent? That's another some of you. How many of you are in either one of those sets? The exact same set of hands went up that we started with. Okay, so those things are logically equivalent or set equivalent. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now in terms of like drawing a Venn diagram for this, like the second you get more than three things, it becomes like impossible to draw without looking all crazy. I mean, unless you want to make some of those dank Facebook memes with, that have like three Venn diagram things going on. No? Are you guys into the, to the memeing? Especially the dank ones? Yeah. <sighs> Kids these days. Okay, so this is a distribution law, okay, that and distributes over or. Now, similarly, could I have done uh, this with, um, uh, with or, yeah, okay. Now, another way that I could see whether or not these things are true is by making a truth table, okay. So let me take, uh, for now, let me take this version of it, okay. And if I think of A, B, and C either being true or false, okay, um, then what is um, how many different pat or how many different combinations of A, B, and C all being either true or false are they? Are there total? Okay, this would be equivalent to me asking the question: flip three coins in a row. How many different possible outcomes of heads, tails, heads, and so on are there? There should be eight of them. Okay, why eight? Okay, first off, are you? Does anybody think it's a different number besides eight? Okay, so how many options are there for the first coin flip? Two, okay, how many for the second? How many for the third? So two for all of them. Okay, now, how do we go from two to eight? Well, what's two times two times two? Eight last time I checked, right? Okay, but why do I multiply? Right, that's the real question, right? I mean, it's obvious that two times two times two is eight, but why is two times two times two the answer to my question? Well, let's say I flip the second coin. Does it ending up as heads or tails have anything to do with the results of the first coin flip? No. So the first coin flip had two options, and the second coin flip, let's say it ends up as heads. Well, there's two total possibilities. The first one heads, the second one heads. Let's say it ends up as tails. What else is there? Actually, I said that wrong. Uh, let's say the second one turns up heads. How many possibilities of outcomes are there? I could have had heads heads, or I could have had tails heads. But the first coin flip did not influence the second coin flip in any way whatsoever. And so those, uh, the number of ways of doing it multiply. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so are we convinced that there are eight total situations that we need to consider, okay? Uh, because A, B, and C could be every combination of one being true and the others being false or whatever is possible. Okay, so I'm gonna have to make here a really giant table. 
Okay. So um, in addition to being math class today, this is also like giant spreadsheet day. Okay. So Excel would actually be really handy for like keeping this straight because, you know, my handwriting is terrible. Okay. So we have eight total possibilities for what A, B, and C can be individually. Okay. And let me use zero for false and one for true, just for cleanliness. Okay, so let me write all eight of them down. Oops. Okay, now you might ask, how did I know which order to write all these things down in, and how did I do it so quickly? I mean, other than being the professor, right? That kind of comes with the territory. So what I did was I actually just wrote the same order that I would have. Okay, so let's say that I asked you guys to write down all numbers between one or zero and 999. What would the first number you write down be? Zero, 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 then? 001, 002, 003, 004, 005, and so on. Then you'd hit 009, and then what would the next one be? 010, then 011, then 012, and so on, right? So there's that natural order that we, we came up with, right? And the second that one of the digits spills over, you move to the next digit and start incrementing and keep going. So it's like a car speedometer, except... Here, I only have the digits 0 and 1. That's it. So there's no 7 or 3 or anything like that. Okay? And I claim, and we'll see more about this in ludicrous detail, that that is the natural order to write them down in. Okay? Do you guys buy it? Okay. That'll sink in because we'll, we'll be doing this basically for the rest of the semester. Okay. So... Now we just got to start filling things in. And to do this, what is it that we're trying to show our equivalent? We're trying to show those two things that are in the blue uh, circle, right? The thing at the top is equivalent to the thing at the bottom. Well, in order to do that, I first need to compute each individual piece. So if I want to compute A and B or C, then I need to first compute B or C. Okay, yes, question? I'm sorry? Oh, it's just off the screen because I had to scroll up a little bit. Okay, so I need to compute B or C. I need to compute A and B or C. Okay, so those are the two things from the first statement. And then I need to do the same thing to build up the second statement. And I'm sorry, this is getting messy. Okay, so let me clean up these lines a little bit. And you know, it's actually kind of funny because guess what this magic iPad can do? It can draw straight lines. Isn't that rad? Okay, so do we accept that these are the, uh, the, all the stuff that we need to compute, and then we actually have to do it, but we'll do that in a second. Okay, so what I'm computing here are all the constituent pieces of our two statements up there. And then what I want to convince us is, how do we know that these things are equivalent? If they have the exact same truth table, are they equivalent? Yeah, that would make sense, right? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference if one or the other hits you upside the head. Okay, so we got a lot of crap to fill out here, but let's just do it. So, what I'm going to do is let's do the top half together, and then I'll let you guys do the bottom half and take a couple moments to yourself, right? You can do it, Liam. Come on. All right, B or C. If B and C are zero, what's B or C? Zero. Next one? Zero or one? One. 
one or zero, one or one. Okay, so let's make sure we're clear on that one. Okay, questions about that first entry, this first set of entries. We, oui, no. Okay, all right, now let's move to the right. B or C, we have these four values for it. I want to and that against A. So A is zero, B or C is zero, what's that and that? So this and that is zero, good. Zero and one is and zero. All right, and in fact, aren't all four of them zero? Are we convinced that all four of, uh, four of them are zero? Why? Yes or why? Okay, so A in these first four is zero, yes? What's zero and anything? And so does it matter what any of these are? For this box right there, no, it's, it's irrelevant. Okay. Now, for the other boxes and stuff, it will be, but for this one, it, it didn't matter. Okay, good. All right, similarly, uh, we need to do A and B. Okay, so here's A, here's B. Uh, what are all four of those going to be? Also zero, because what is A in all the top it box? It's all zeros, okay? And lastly, what's A and C? They're all zero again, because in the top half, all the A's are zero, okay? Yet again. Okay, so this last box is the or of this box or this box. So what's zero or zero? Okay, and so actually what are all four of these going to be? Zero. Okay, good. All right, so we're halfway done. All right, so take a few minutes and uh, talk amongst yourselves, okay, and fill out the rest of the table, the bottom half, and then uh, I'll write the, the correct answers up and we'll see if we kind of agree on them and, and this is starting to make sense. Okay, so you got, got the idea? Not rocket science? We could do some rocket science though. I mean, it's not like it's rocket, oh wait. <laughs> And actually, who, who all is a freshman this semester? Okay. So you all are in freshman tutorial. So last year, I taught a freshman tutorial on rocket science. And that was the title. Because that went in, and so all of their transcripts say rocket science B or rocket science A. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, the dean was less enthusiastic about my other idea, which was underwater basket weaving. Um, yeah. So you guys have heard of underwater basket weaving before, right? So when I was a kid and my parents would talk about underwater basket weaving as being like this joke college class, I was always imagining that it was like half basket weaving and half scuba diving. Like, and that you'd be at the bottom of the ocean weaving a basket or something. And I'm like, man, that actually sounds pretty hard. But it turns out that what is it? You just weave the basket in a bucket of water because it makes the material more. I, I was so disappointed when I found that out as I got older. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that it doesn't involve scuba diving? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, not, it's not called in a bucket basket weaving, it's called underwater basket weaving. So, yeah, exactly. It makes sense that you do it in a bucket of water, but like, why wouldn't we logically just then scuba dive and do it at the bottom of a pool? Yeah. So it's kind of like when I was really little, 
So you know at Wendy's how they have like the, the pumps for the ketchup, right, to put in the little thingy? Well, I had it in my head that there were like ketchup fields out in the desert in Texas and like trucks would go around and there'd be this giant oil derrick pumping ketchup out of the ground. And then the truck would go around like an oil truck and fill up all the Wendy's at night. And <laughs> Before I learned what a tomato was. <laughs> anyway. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and write them in here. And uh, you guys can tell me if you agree or not. Okay, so do you guys agree with all of my computations? Yeah? All right, now what I want you to observe is that this box and this box are exactly the same as each other. So what does that mean about the statement, the logical statement at the top of this box versus that one? They're the same thing, they're equivalent, okay? If they have the same truth table, they are the same logical, or they're equivalent logical statements. Okay, now here's where this is gonna start to pay dividends, and we'll continue with this discussion on um, uh, Friday and kind of to tie everything off. If I wanted to wire up a circuit that did either one of these, I could, right? So this one, how many gates would I have? I have an OR gate followed by an AND gate. That's two gates, yes? This one, how many gates do I have? Three. If they're logically equivalent, which one should I choose? Probably the one that's only got two gates. Okay, so if I have some, and this is only a Boolean expression that involves three inputs. What about if I had a Boolean expression that involved a thousand inputs or some ludicrous number, okay? It might be really horrible and complicated, but using this rule or these rules, okay, and there's a couple more that I'll show you in a second, um, I could simplify it almost like you simplify things in algebra class back in high school, right? and find an equivalent way of writing it that gives me a simpler circuit. Would we agree that's a good thing? Okay, so what's the trade-off here? You can do it easy and wire up some complicated circuit, or you can do a little math in advance and make a simpler circuit. Yeah? Which one would you rather do? doing a little bit of math in advance. It pays dividends, right? It's like buying Tesla stock at a dollar. You'd make bank, okay? All right, so if we have two statements that we suspect are equivalent, okay, we have the rules of Boolean algebra that will allow us to, to simplify, but if we're not convinced that two things are the same, we can always sit down and do this truth table thing. Now, if I have a thousand inputs, how many different combinations of A, B, C, and D, or, well, how many different patterns are there for the inputs? Two to the power of a thousand, which is a very large number, okay? Um, which then it's not possible to do this by hand. Fortunately, we invented computers, okay? Although that is maybe putting the cart before the horse here because if we're talking about how to build a computer, we can't then use a computer to help us build the computer that's sort of circular, but yeah, okay. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk just briefly is De Morgan's Laws. Okay, and there's, there's uh, two of them. And basically this is how the idea of not plays with the idea of and and or. Okay, so like before, we'll write it in English, set theory, logic, and Boolean. Okay, so there's English. Uh, set theory would be A intersect B's complement is equivalent to A 
um, complement um, union B's complement. And then, so that's set theory, then logic would be um, uh, not A and B is equivalent to not A or not B. And I'll have to write the Boolean one down here because I've run myself out of space. Uh, this would be um, uh, A, B bar is equal to A bar plus B bar. Okay, so those are the four De Morgan's laws, or four ways of saying De Morgan's laws. Okay, now let's convince ourselves that this is, these make sense. So for that, let me maybe take the, the logical one here. So let's say that A is, again, the set of people who are in computer science, and B is the set of people who are in a math class this semester. Okay? So who happens to be in both? Okay. Liam, let me pick on you for the moment. Under what circumstances would Liam be lying to us that he is in both? If there, he wasn't in one or he wasn't in the other, okay? So Liam is lying would be equivalent to saying that the opposite of Liam is telling the truth, okay? So Liam's not in both means he's either not in one or not in the other. Does that make sense? So when you say it in English, like, oh, yeah, makes complete sense, right? How could he not be in both classes? He's not in one or he's not in the other. Maybe he's in neither, who knows, but he's definitely not in one or the other. Okay, good. All right, so that's how uh, not plays with and. How does it play with or? This is where it gets really beautiful, I think. Okay. Let me just write them and then we'll talk through them. All right. So let's talk through them. Under what circumstances? Okay, so let's take uh, A or B, okay? Let's say again, A is the people that are in this room and B is calculus class, people who are in math class, okay? Under what circumstances is the idea of you being in either one not true? How could you fail to be in either computer science or math? You're not in either. Okay, well, that's equivalent to you're not in computer science and you're not in math. Well, makes sense, right? Hopefully. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to have to quit for the day. But where we're going to go with this, and so like I said, we'll kind of polish off this stuff on Friday, uh, is two things. One, this De Morgan's Law stuff. You notice that there's sort of a complementary symmetry here. It's almost like the PMOS and NMOS stuff in our complementary metal oxide semiconductor circuits. Right? And then we'll talk about exclusive ore, and that will conclude our circuit stuff. All right. Have a fantastic chicken tender day, and I will see you all on Friday.